Hey everyone, welcome back to Control System Lectures. Now for this week I had originally wanted to continue our discussion on system identification techniques. However, I've received so many requests for lead lag compensators via Twitter and in the video comment sections below that I decided to switch gears and talk about that. But I can't give a real good explanation of phase lead and lag compensators without first talking about the final value theorem and steady state error. So that is the topic for this video. Now the final value of a function is exactly what the name implies. If you were talking about a soccer match and asked what the final score was, you'd really be asking what was the score at the end of time, or after time ran out. Now this is analogous to the final value of a function, where you would just ask the question, what is the value of the output when time runs out, or at time equals infinity? Of course you can't really say when time equals infinity, that's unsolvable. So you say, what does the final value approach as time approaches infinity? We can draw a few notional plots of outputs to illustrate what the final values would be. In this first example, the output approaches zero as time approaches infinity. So we would say that the final value is zero. In this case, the final value of the function is one. And if you have a function that oscillates for all time, then there is no final value and it continues to change forever you could say that the final value for this function is undefined. And finally, if the function continuously increases, then again, there is no final value. However, you could say that the final value in this case is infinite. It's sort of intuitive that if the output converges on a single value, then the final value exists. If the output blows up to infinity or continues to oscillate for all eternity, then the final value is meaningless. We're going to use that concept later when we describe the theorem. Okay, so now the question is, how do we calculate the final value of a function? Well, in the time domain, you can figure out what the final value is by calculating what the value is for an input that equals infinity. Of course, the way we do this is by taking the limit as time approaches infinity. So you could take this differential equation and then take the limit as time approaches infinity, which would require a little bit of calculus. And this is useful and definitely makes sense as an equation, but we're control engineers, and we like to work in the s-plane. Not only because we work with transfer functions, which are s-domain representations of differential equations, but also because it simplifies the math. Differential equations in the time domain become algebraic equations in the s-domain. So is there a way to find out what the final time value is of a function using the s-domain representation? Well, there is a way, and that's by using the final value theorem. Now, I'm not going to prove the final value theorem in this video. I'll just write out the theorem here and then just use it. However, for the interested viewer, I've put a couple of links in the video description where you can go to find the proof. So let's talk about this equation. Instead of taking the limit as time goes to infinity on the differential equation, we take the Laplace transform of it, multiply it by s, and then take the limit as s goes to zero. And if we already have the Laplace transform, it's even easier, because we can just use this equation to find out what the time domain limit is as time approaches infinity, all without ever having to take a limit of a differential equation, or without having to transform back to the time domain. But there is a catch when using this equation. The final value theorem doesn't work on every single transfer function. So now we need to develop some sort of rules of when we can and can't use it. To show you graphically where you can use this equation, I'm going to use the s-plane, and I'm going to break it up into four different regions. Region 1 is the right half-plane, or anything to the right of the vertical imaginary axis. Region 2 is the imaginary axis, but without the origin. Region 3 is everything in the left half-plane, and region 4 is the origin itself. Let's look at what it means to have a pole in each of these regions, starting with the right half-plane. We know that if there's a pole in the right half plane, then the system is unstable. That's because the real component is positive, and e raised to a positive real number blows up to infinity. And so the final value of a system with a pole in the right half plane does not exist, but is infinite. And as you can see from this example here, not only do we know that the final value doesn't exist, but the final value theorem actually produces a wrong value if you use it. So we don't want to use this theorem if the system has a pole anywhere in the right half plane. 
For the second region, we know that if a pole exists on the imaginary axis, then the impulse response of the system will be oscillatory, and therefore the final value is again undefined. That is because E raised to an imaginary number produces sines and cosines. And if you use the final value theorem in this case, it again produces the wrong value. In fact, the final value theorem will give us the mean value of the oscillation, which isn't what we're going for. So you don't want to use the final value theorem if your system has a pair of poles that reside on the imaginary axis. Now for the third region, we know that if a pole exists in the left half plane, then the impulse response for that system will be stable and eventually die out to zero. That's because E raised to a negative real number converges to zero as time goes to infinity. And if you use the final value theorem in this case, it produces the correct value, finally. But the value will always be zero for a transfer function with every single pole in the left half plane. In the fourth region, we have a system with a pole at the origin. Now this is an integrator, one over s. And so just from that, we can quickly guess that the impulse response to an integrator will be the integral of the impulse. And from its definition, we know that the area under the impulse curve with unity gain is just one, which means that the impulse response will be one for all time, or a step function. And if you use the final value theorem in this case, it produces the correct value again. Now, for reasons that are beyond me, the number of poles at the origin is called the transfer function type, or the system type. Therefore, if there are no poles at the origin, then the type is zero. And for type zero systems, the final value is also zero. That is, of course, if all of the poles exist in the left half plane. If there is one pole at the origin, then that is a type one system. And the final value of a type one system is some finite real number. Again, only if the rest of the poles are in the left half plane. And if there are two poles at the origin, then that's a type 2 system. And just like the integral of a step output is a ramp, type 2 systems ramp up to infinity for their final value. And if you keep increasing the type number, the ramp then turns into acceleration and so on and so on. But they all have final values of infinity for any system that's type 2 or higher. So let's quickly recap to make sure that I didn't lose anyone so far. Now you can use the final value theorem only if the transfer function has poles exclusively in the left half plane or at the origin or a combination of the two. If there's even a single pole in the right half plane or a pair of poles on the imaginary line, then you can't use the final value theorem. Also, if all poles are in the left half plane, then this is a type zero system. And I apologize, but I accidentally wrote type one right here. But for type zero systems, the final value will always be zero. If the system is a type one, then the final value will equal some real value. And if the system is type two or higher, the final value will be infinity, but at least the final value theorem will produce the correct answer. Okay, so let's use the final value theorem in practice now. Let's start with this transfer function, one over s squared plus s. And we wanna find out what the final value will be for an impulse input. Now the Laplace transform of an impulse function is just one, so that's our input. Now this system is a type one system, and you can see that clearly by factoring out a one over s. One pole is at the origin, and the second pole is in the left half plane, so we can use the final value theorem, which we do and find that the final value is one. And if you plot the impulse response for this function, you'll see it looks something like this, just as we predict with a final value of one. But what if we wanted to find the final value of a step input for this system? Well, just like we did earlier, we can integrate the impulse input to get a step input. And when we do that, we've added another pole at the origin, making this a type two system. And if you use the final value theorem, now you're gonna find that the final value is infinite, just like you'd expect from a type two system. Now I wanna pause here real quick and show you something that I find interesting. For a step response to a transfer function, we add a pole at the origin. And when we use the final value theorem, we add a zero at the origin. And these two cancel each other out and you're left with the original transfer function, which you set all of the s's to zero in and then you can find the final value. So the final value for a step input into a system that has all of the poles in the left half plane is really easy. 
All you have to do is set s to 0, and what you're left with is the final value. Now let's take a block diagram of a system that you're really familiar with, the negative feedback control system. Here you can find the final value to an input by first combining blocks, and then condensing the system into a single transfer function, and then using the final value theorem. But most of the time you won't really care what the actual final value is. Let me explain it this way. A well-designed control system is made in such a way that the output follows the input as close as possible. So that means that if you input a ramp function, you would expect something close to a ramp out. But we know that the final value of a ramp is infinite. So how is that good information about the performance of our control system? Well, it really isn't. Remember that a closed-loop control system is designed to drive the error term to zero. And since the error is the difference between the output and the reference input, the final value of the error term is a better measure of how the system is performing. Now the final value of the error term is called the steady state error, and we can use the final value theorem to find this pretty easily. First we need to rewrite the transfer function from the input u of s to the error term e of s. Now to help you visualize this a bit better, I'll redraw the block diagram like this. But you can check yourself. These are identical systems, I'm just drawing it a little differently. And now you can condense this system into a single block using whatever your favorite method is. I always forget the quick shortcut ways to condense these blocks, so I always revert back to the simple algebraic method like I'm doing here. And this is why this method is so awesome. If the steady state error is zero or a very small number, we may conclude that our design is adequate. However, if the steady state error is infinite, then maybe we need to rethink the controller a bit. And once again, I apologize for making another mistake here. In the final value theorem, I forgot to write the s prior to the transfer function. Anyway, we can figure out what the steady state error is for any number of inputs just by replacing u of s with the appropriate number of poles at the origin. And as you've probably guessed by now, as you increase the input poles, you're increasing the system type. And at some point, your system won't be able to follow your input perfectly. Of course, you'll very rarely require your system to have to follow, say, a constantly accelerating input for all time. But if you do, then you can always reduce the system type by adding a zero at the origin. So I know I kind of raced through a lot of information quickly in this video. But as always, if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the section below and I'll try to get back to you. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thanks for watching.